So I wanted to uh, thank Dr. John McCarroll from the uh, CVEF for giving us this talk today on uh, So You Want to Implant a Pacemaker. If you want to take it from here, Dr. Joma is from the uh, Cardiovascular Education Foundation and has been working for many years tirelessly to support and build programs around the world. So I'm very excited for this enlightening conversation. Thank you so much, Mr. Hill. And uh, thank you, everyone who is here. Um, I saw someone raise their hand and I allowed them to speak. I didn't know if they wanted to say something really quick before we started. <laughs> Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's my pleasure to see you. I think we met in Boston, Madam Presenter. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. The, the, the first guy was talking very pertinent, uh, uh, bundle branch, left the bundle branch earlier passing. Uh, I wonder why he couldn't have actually uh, posted, uh, the, I mean, the video showing how he's approaching that. It was very nice, to, uh, nice, to, I mean, he, if we could have shared the, uh, I mean, the video or slide, then it was very pertinent. Oh, okay. We can yeah. definitely see about doing that in at a future date. Thank you so much for um, your comment. So for, Thank you um, so much. <laughs> so for everybody else, um, you know, I'm going to have some questions that are kind of in the, um, in the slides and um, let me see, maybe I will be able to, um, hmm. okay, maybe I'll be able to put in a, a poll so I'll see whether I can do that or not. Um, and then if I'm able to, then I will let you know. So um, pretty much um, what we're trying to talk about today is, you know, so you want to implant a pacemaker, considerations for setting up device implantation and resource poor environment. And um, there are definitely, you know, reasons why we'd want to do this. Um, first of all, we have the patients who need devices um, and, you know, pacemakers, there are only a few emergencies, I would say, you know, that come that an electrophysiologist has to deal with. Um, actually, there's truly only one emergency that you really have to come into the hospital for, and that is um, sudden um, loss of, you know, conduction. Um, leading to heart block. And so either yourself or an interventional cardiology has to put in a pacemaker. Um, otherwise, um, you know, they would have to, um, you know, otherwise they would um, basically put in a temporary pacemaker um, when they come into the cath lab or um, they would, you know, this is one of the those procedures that's emergent. It's our, um, it's our, um, I guess, our version of a STEMI. Um, and um, we take this very seriously. And so I'm gonna start off with a case, you know, so let's say we have this 35 year old woman and she has no significant past medical history. She has feelings of fatigue and decreased energy for the past few years. And she was finally um, advised to come to the doctor. And then um, this is her EKG, right? So um, I want you to kind of take a look at it and look at it really um, closely. And um, let's see. did you want them to post in the chat what they think might be going on here? Well, not yet. I'm trying okay. to see. Let me see if I can do this. All right. Well, somebody has already said, um, you know, complete heart block. So pretty much I said, okay, what is your diagnosis? So if you can post in the chat right now what you think it is. Um, I have um, Ola Tema who says complete heart block. And if you agree, um, somebody says um, third um, degree AV block, yes or no. So I can see here's some two to one as well, some folks are saying. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Carroll, do you mind pulling the uh, EKG back up? Seeing some high grade AV block. That's a safe one there. Okay. 
So high grade AV block, third degree with a junctional escape, complete heart block, two to one. So um, this would be a complete heart block. And the reason how you can tell it's complete heart block is, you know, there are, so you have first degree AV block where you're talking about atrioventricular block. So you have first degree AV block, you have second degree AV block, and then of course you have third degree or complete heart block. Your first degree and your third degree will always give you an R wave um, that is regular. So the first degree of E block, it'll give you a regular R wave because it's just describing, uh, you know, delay in AV conduction, right? So the distance from the P wave to the QRS will always be the same, right? So it will always give you that regular QRS. The other thing that gives you a regular QRS is a third degree AV block. And so if you look at the EKG, before you start looking at the P waves and the QRSs and trying to figure out what the relationship is, if your impression is that the R waves are uniform or the R waves are equidistant from each other, then that is more likely to be a third degree AV block than not. Now, of course, there's a two to one AV block that could satisfy that, but in two to one AV block, you would expect to see that the um, distance between your P wave and your QRS should always be the same. And in this particular situation, you see that they are working irrespective of each other. So therefore, this would be complete heart block. So that's really good. Now, what would you um, do in this um, particular patient? Would you observe the patient? Do a treadmill stress test? Would you place a pacemaker? Or would you... Um, do an echo because you need more information. So if you can put your answer in the chat. So I see a lot of C's, C, 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 C. Echo. So some people are saying D, okay, echocardiogram. And can somebody say, for those who said that they wanted an echo, could they say why they wanted an echo? Because they need further information. Okay, what kind of further information would you be looking for? Anybody want to answer that question? So you can think about it and put it in the chat as we go further. So pacemaker implantation, like I mentioned, really important when we talk about life-saving cardiac care. Um, when we are considering placement of a pacemaker, first of all, you know, you have to have a patient that's indicated for, um, you know, a pacemaker placement as a result of symptomatic um, bradycardia. Um, going back to the chat, somebody said an echo to rule out infection as a cause of heart block. Another person said searching for any possibility of ischemia or valvular disease. And um, somebody else said, okay, to know other causes, whether they are transient. So, okay, so we'll come back to that question um, towards the end when we're discussing, back to discussing the patient. Now, when we're talking about considerations, you know, for pacemaker plan, um, implantation, it's not just simple, as simple as, okay, you have a patient, maybe somebody brings you a pacemaker, and then you say, okay, we're cool, we're just going to put it in. Um, it's a technically easy procedure, but you have to be trained. And um, if you're not trained, then you could have complications and it's, you know, a little bit more um, challenging than you would like to um, like it to be. And so, you know, the different things that you have to have in place, you have to have a procedural area, right? And this procedural area has to be equipped with the necessary tools. Like um, some of you heard Dr. Edafit speak on, you know, earlier when we were um, talking, um, you know, you have to have the right tools because if you don't have the right tools, then what is a very simple procedure ends up becoming really complex. Um, the other things that you have to have, you have to have procedural expertise both on the um, you know, level of the physicians who are involved in the case, as well as, in, as on the level of the catheterization lab staff or the OR lab staff. 
for the physicians, you have to have a well-trained interventional or invasive cardiologist who is able to put in a pacemaker. And then you also have to have training um, with regards to the referring physician, right? Because for you to be able to send a patient to um, get a pacemaker placed, um, you should have a referring physician who knows what it is that they're looking for. Because a lot of these patients, particularly if they're young enough, they come in with very nonspecific symptoms. They might come in saying, oh, I feel tired. I feel fatigued. You know, there's some people who will be like, oh, you're just lazy. You're not doing what you need to do. Um, but not knowing that there's a medical reason for this. And so you have to have a relatively high index for suspicion um, for diagnosing the patient who would need a pacemaker. Um, the second thing is, you know, looking at your, once you have um, figured out how to do it and you're going to place the pacemaker, then, you know, you have to have well-trained um, pacemaker um, cat lab staff. So your nurses, your x-ray techs, um, you know, and a physiologist who's able to help you with the pacer, um, you definitely want to make sure that um, you have all those patient, um, all those um staff well-trained so that you can have um, an excellent program. Um, so let's see, somebody um, was raising their hand. Um, Josephine Rogath, did you have a question or a comment? Okay. Um, all right, so I will um, ask you to unmute if you um, feel like you wanted to speak, um, then um, you could do so. Um, and then, so going back to the presentation, of course you would want to have you know, your patients um, identified so that you could place your device. Um, so starting with cath lab is not really an easy feat. This was from a, um, a paper that was written in 2019, um, talking about the number of cath labs in Africa is not a really comprehensive list, but it basically does kind of tell us, okay, exactly um, what's going on in um, the different countries, um, as well as, you know, the different, um, you know, countries in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, they put a rough estimate of labs in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think these numbers are not really up to date just because I know in Nigeria we have more than six now. But um, it's this was, um, like I said, published in about 2019 and I think with the data from 2017. Um, but as you can see, the number of cath labs that are capable of doing pacemakers not really that much, right? So you have some, West Africa is like, you know, empty. Um, East Africa, a little bit empty there. Central Africa, I mean, there's nothing there. And then you have more in South Africa where you see a lot. Oh, what did you say then? Okay. So, um, Basically, um, when we, um, you know, Bonnie et al. in 2017 kind of um, came up with this, um, you know, paper with, where they had done a survey of um, different centers in um, Africa, trying to ask them, hey, what are you able to do and what is the um, electrophysiology capabilities in Africa as a whole. And what they were able to find is that in the countries that have the bright green, you did have proper pacing activity. Um, but basically, if you can look over here and you look down there, you really can't see, like if you look here and you look there, you really can't see um, a lot of pacing um, pacing um, capabilities there, which is a little bit concerning. Um, and when you um, look at the numbers, the numbers really tell us, okay, that there is a lot of work to be done. Pacemaker implanting rate per million of the population um, is basically in 2014, the last time was 0.12. So less than one pacemaker per million um, of the um, population was placed in Nigeria, you know, above one, two in Benin Republic, three in Kenya, um, 11 in Senegal, so I guess they're doing great. Um, in South Africa, 114. In Tunisia, um, 201. And Mauritius is um, 239. So all of these numbers, you know, you might think, okay, well, at least here, the 239, that's great. Um, but really, it's not really um, that great because when you compare that to um, 
the Western world, um, the numbers are really much higher. So um, in the same paper that was written by Vani, they talked about pacemaker implantation rate of countries in Africa when compared to Europe. And if you look at Germany, um, it was 1,152 per million. And in you know Africa, we're less than a thousand. So that is definitely you know something that we need to consider. And it's not because we don't have the patient population um, that can accommodate um, this very important life-saving therapy. Now there have been a few um, advances advances that have made their way over the last few years. Um, the first thing was um, the um, provision of re-sterilize and repurpose devices um, for use in um, pacemaker implantation. Um, they had just finished enrolling um, patients in the My Heart, Your Heart trial. Um, hopefully those results will come out in the next year or so. Um, and that will give us a lot more information about the safety and efficacy of this practice um, for um, patients who are not able to afford new devices. And this could open up, you know, um, a whole, um, you know, world of patients um, or a whole world of opportunities for patients to be able to um, get their life-saving um, devices. Now, um, you know, when we start thinking about placement of a device or placement of a pacemaker, a lot of us who do it, particularly in the Western world, we're used to coming into a room like this where you have a cath lab with, you know, the C-arm that's pretty stationary but has a lot of power in the fluoroscopy. Um, you have your table and you have this big room with your anesthesia machine, et cetera. But sometimes, you know, it's um, not, um, you're not able to provide that because all of this is really expensive. Not that there isn't some, right? So in Nigeria, this is the cath lab at Lesouth. And as you can see, they do have a C-arm and they have, you know, a lot of training staff, um, trained staff able to do these cases, this is um, the cath lab in Abuja, basically able to do the same thing. That's Dr. Dafe there um, doing his case, um, which is really exciting. But the other thing to consider is maybe you don't have to use um, a fluoroscopy suite, and maybe you can just use a C-arm. And for those of us who work in a hospital, you know that a lot of hospitals at least have a C-arm where um, they do cases with um, ortho sometimes, sometimes they're doing cases with neuro. Um, and so, you know, you can also use this for placement of a pacemaker just because a pacemaker placement doesn't really need that much temporal resolution um, in placement. So what would you need as tools as at a minimum? And of course, you know, when I'm saying that you're trying to develop a program, you're not doing this in isolation, right? You're doing this with um, other things happening. You're looking at the training of, you know, the physician. You're looking at providing the room with um, the um, tools that you need. Um, and then you're also looking at training your referral physicians for patients so that by the time all of these three things come together, you can have a very successful program. So when you're looking at your room, you have to have an OR room. You have to have a room where um, everything is sterile because this has to be a sterile procedure. Um, you are placing a device with leads that go into the heart and that can be a high source of infection if care is not taken. So therefore an OR room is essential or at least the sterile room is essential. The C arm is very essential here. Um, you know, until they produce, um, you know, leads that are able to be placed through ultrasound, you know, you really do need the C arm for correct placement of your device. Um, you need visualization all the way from where you make your pocket, which typically is in the left subclavian area, all the way down into your heart. And so the C arm definitely does give us that, um, you know, visualization that we need. Of course, we need a bed that is able to allow the C-arm or the X-ray to um, visualize through. Um, you need a table where you're going to place all your implements, and I'll show you an example of what that looks like. You need an external defibrillator just in case, because sometimes, you know what, in placement of your device, sometimes you might actually lose um, 
you know, you might lose native conduction, and so you might need external pacing, so an external defibrillator is necessary. Of course, you need an EKG machine, um, because if you don't have one, you're not going to be able to know what's happening with the patient. So if the patient loses conduction, you won't be able to see that. So you need that continuous EKG monitoring. Um, antibiotics, definite. So before we do the case, we usually will start the patient on antibiotics. And actually that is standard that within two hours of device and um, um, patient incision, you have to have antibiotics completed. Um, anesthetics, very important. We use local anesthesia. So lidocaine is your friend. Um, and in addition to that, it's also helpful if you can use some um, anesthetics and analgesia as well. And so I typically will use fentanyl and Versed to just um, basically make the patient a little bit more comfortable. This bed is very uncomfortable for the patient and the procedure lasts anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the type of device that you're placing. Um, sometimes it can be longer than that. Um, that was once I was trying to place a CRT and that took about three hours. So it can become very uncomfortable for the patient and the patient might start moving around if we don't give enough pain medication. Of course, you need protective lead shielding. So the, um, the physicians, the staff have to be wearing um, their lead to protect them from the x-ray that is um, brought out by the C-arm. Um, and then of course, you'll need your sutures, sterile drapes, CRM cover and a backup power source for um, your CRM and for everything that you're using um, in the um, procedure. Oops. Now, but you see ARM versus the um, cath lab, what um, do you have to consider when you're trying to figure out whether you're doing the C, um, a C-ARM versus um, going to go straight for a cath lab? Well, the cath lab does give you a lot more flexibility. You're able to do a little bit more. You're able to, um, you know, do, in addition to doing, um, you know, pacemaker placement, sometimes you're able to do um, CRT placement, which needs that kind of more discrete um, visualization of wires that you might not be able to see with um, a C-arm. The C-arm doesn't have as much resolution. It's definitely much more powerful than more post-processing options. You can, you know, look at things, zoom in, zoom out, um, basically play things, keep things on review so that you can kind of see where you've been and see where you're going. It does allow you to also do coronary interventions, which you cannot quite do on a C-arm, right? Um, versus the C-arm. Now, why would you consider do using a C-arm versus a cath lab? Well, the C-arm does allow you to start up a procedure lab less expensively. So whereas a cath lab, you know, it can go anywhere from, you know, in dollars, $300,000 to $800,000 for um, a cath lab, um, a C-arm costs typically about eighteen dollars to $25,000. So as you can see, you know, it is, you know, orders of magnitude less expensive than um, a cath lab. It is definitely less powerful. So the highest you can see is about 25 kilowatts, and it does not give you that resolution. It's enough for a pacemaker, but it's not exactly enough for something that is a little bit more, um, needs a little bit more finesse, a little bit more resolution. Um, another good thing is that it's mobile. So you can use it um, if you have multiple OR rooms, you can take it from one room to the other and not have to worry about, you know, um, breaking it or spoiling it. Um, and it doesn't require any fixed um, lead shielding also because it doesn't have that much power. It doesn't produce that much x-rays. Um, and so that would be um, definitely something to consider. Now, with your implantables and tools, when you're placing your um, pacemaker, the procedure itself, we've talked about this before. If you go on our YouTube channel, there are definitely um, a couple of um, presentations where we talked about, you know, actual placement of a pacemaker. Um, if you're running through it very simply, you make a small incision underneath the clavicle, you access your vein using a Selginger technique, put a couple of wires down, and then you're able to put a sheath I like using the sheets that have the hemostatic valve there where you're, um, you don't have blood flow back. But of course, those are more expensive than the ones that um, 
allow blood flow back. And of course, those sheets are typically slittable um, so that you can um, keep your lead in while you take the sheath off. Um, and then you put your wires through, um, make your pocket. And for you to do all of that and to do all of that with, um, with um, good um, speed and with you know good tools, you have to have at the very least these implantables and tools. So that includes your scalpel, of course, for you to make that initial incision, incision um, scissors um, for you to be able to dissect, to make your pocket, retractors so that you're able to um, basically see into the pocket. I typically will use um, Wheatlanders for this. Um, you definitely need a lot of bowls and towels so that you can keep everything where it needs to be. Um, your programmer and wands are needed so that you can tell what's happening once you place your lead because you have to be able to tell what's happening, whether you have good contact, whether you're in a very stable position. Um, your PSA and PSA cable adapter, the PSA is your um, programmer, um, and um, it will help you figure out where you are and also test lead placement. Um, the device, which is the pacemaker generator, that is typically the most expensive part of all of this. Um, and um, like I said, this has been a rate limiting step getting a pacemaker generator. Typically you would have to buy it, which can cost anywhere from, you know, um, 700 to $1,500. Um, so you convert that to your local currency at will. Um, your pacing leads, of course, very important, hex wrench, PSA cables, um, you know, your lead introducers, like I mentioned, and then, of course, a syringe and needle um, for you to be able to um, make that um, access to your veins. This is what I typically like my table to look like. Of course, you know, this really depends on, you know, um, what you have available. Um, for me, this is a six foot table. Um, you can see where um, the tools are sitting over there. And this is how I like to place um, out my, um, out, I like to place out my um, tools. Um, I'm a little bit, um, I guess, picky about how I place things. And so, but this is typically how I like my table set up. Um, usually though, you know, folks kind of place it wherever they want. Um, and it's typically as, you know, as you would like it. And of course it would be nice if we had a cath lab, a live 12 lead. Um, the live 12 lead is essentially, um, especially important for patients who have, um, who you're going to do a left bundle placement. Um, if you have temporary pacing equipment for those patients who have complete heart block, um, you might get into the ventricle and immediately lose um, your native conduction. And so temporary pacing equipment could be, um, is very um, essential. Your lead stylets are typically in with the lead um, that you're actually placing with. So um, those are actually supplied for you. Um, suture sleeves are also actually supplied for you. Micropuncture, um, basically if you um, have some anxiety about your access, you can definitely use a micropuncture needle. And of course, you know, liking to see is very important. And so if you can have surgical lamps, that would be great. Um, defibrillation, defibrillation pads and cautery um, is also really important. And the defib pads you place on the pacer um, so that you can, um, you place on the pacer, um, on the patient so that you can pace the patient if needed. So with regards to um, training of your procedural list, um, they go through a long um, slog of training, right? So after medical school, after doing your housemanship, if you, like in Nigeria, you have to do your group service, um, you know, you go through that. Then you start off doing your general internal medicine or pediatrics, if you will. And then after that, you have to do some more training in cardiology. And typically that can take anywhere from six to eight years, really depending on your country. Um, after that, you go on and do what we, um, you know, suggest that you do is um, an interventional cardiology year where you are able to get a huge volume of um, invasive procedures under your belt because that those are the um, tools and those are the um, skills that you're going to use and those translate very well into training for pacemakers. 
you know, when you're doing, trying to get access, you know, for a coronary intervention, for instance, even though you're going into the artery, that, you know, comfort level in, you know, getting access will serve you well in doing a pacemaker implantation, where this time you're going into the vein that sits on top of the lung, right? And so one of the complications that we think about when we're doing that is, you know, a uh, pneumothorax, and you don't want to have, you know, too much of those. So, you know, having some sort of interventional training is always is very helpful. Um, or, you know, in my case, I didn't do interventional training. I went straight to EP, but that's um, that capability. I could do that because, you know, I have a job basically doing into, um, in, you know, um, electrophysiology is not always um, able to, or you're not always able to in different countries. And so, you know, your chance to get that skill set um, probably is very necessary. Um, it's, it's only able to be done by doing an interventional cardiology year. Now, um, on the flip side, for the um, um, for the physicians who are going to be referring um, the patients, um, what we need is a recognition of abnormal um, physical exam findings. We need to know that you will be able to recognize when an, an EKG is abnormal, it, and also. Um, that you have the resources to obtain EKGs in resource-limited settings. And so an EKG machine can be very expensive. You know, in my practice, it can go anywhere from about $500 to, $500 to about $3,000, $4,000, depending on how fancy you want it to be. And if you want it to have AI that interprets the device of the um, lead capture for you, and also if you want it to just give you PDFs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, if you are just doing, you know, a simple EKG, sometimes you can get some as low as, you know, um, less than a little bit less than $500. But if you don't have that, you know, I'm sure all of you know about, you know, the Cardia device, sometimes you can have your, if you have Apple, your Apple Watch, um, that can give you different strips. And this is an example of a patient who had, you know, um, an um, AV block that was detected um, by his Apple Watch. And you can see kind of like the P waves like here and here. So basically some sort of like two to one AV block that was diagnosed, um, you know, um, by the patient's Apple Watch. So you can kind of see here that it's, Basically, you can see at the end of the strip where he resumes his normal conduction, but prior to that, he was two to one. Um, there was um, a third syncopal episode, again, two to one, and this is the EKG strip afterwards. And then when the patient came into the um, emergency room, you could tell that they had some heart block. So um, this was, um, you know, a paper that was written that basically showed um, how um, also cardia can be used in this particular case. Sometimes you can have increased sensitivity if you place the cardia in three different places. So for instance, um, in this particular spot, you had, you know, A, which is lead one, which is basically your left and right, um, you know, fingers, right? And that would give you lead one. Um, this will give you lead two. So if you put it one of them from your um, right arm to your left leg. And then if you go over here in for lead three, um, or I'm um, sorry, for your precordial leads, you just put it across your chest. And then you're able to see the heart in three different directions. So this is kind of a poor man's EKG. This one was just demonstrating that they were able to see some ST um, changes that were worrisome for, um, you know, um, and later on when they got an EKG, they were able to find out that the patient actually had a STEMI. And so that was what they used to treat the patient. And so, you know, maybe there are some cheaper um, options to getting um, a full on EKG machine. For instance, the Cardia costs about $100. Um, and it's definitely something that can be used, you know, in a resource poor environment because you really don't need that much. You just need a phone and um, the cardio device. So that would be really cool. Now, there have been papers that kind of looked at the diagnostic accuracy. And even though this paper, you know, concluded that the smart technology is promising, but um, it's not really, um, you know, up to the level of an EKG machine, um, it does still kind of beg the question that, hey, possibly we could use this in a resource poor setting. 
Now, going on to kind of patient selection, how do we figure out the patients that would need um, a pacemaker? So the patients definitely have to have symptomatic bradycardia. And then you have to look at the locations of block. So you can have different locations. You could have the location of block being in the sinus node, or it could be in the AV node. And each of those have different implications for whether they need, um, you know, heart, um, you know, a pacemaker or not. And the other thing that you want to look at is considerations for accompanying um, conditions. Do they have heart failure? Have they had an infection? Are there some medications that might be causing their symptoms? You know, these are things that you want to look at first before saying, hey, this person definitely needs a pacemaker. So for the levels of block, um, I think we've already talked about this as well. I gave a lecture last year um, that should be up talking about, you know, levels of block in, in the sinus node and the AV node. But for as a brief, um, you know, kind of run through you have your sinoatrial conduction as well as your atrial ventricular conduction. In the AV node, it's divided into suprahissian, intrahissian, and infrahissian. Um, intrahissian is not really, you really need a um, EP study to figure that out. But suprahissian is basically in the AV node itself. Infrahissian is in the bundle branches. With the um, node, the lower the level of block, the higher um, the acuity um, of what you um, need to do for the patient. So for a sinus node, um, a rest is basically a sinus pause. It has to be, you know, um, a PP interval that's greater than three seconds. Um, and it's considered to be, that is considered to be abnormal. Now, if the patient has symptoms with this, then this is definitely something that you want to put in a pacemaker for, even though it's at the level of the sinus node. However, you could have sinoatrial block, also known as sinoauricular block, um, the sinus node function is normal, but transmission to the atrium is blocked. Remember, you have your sinus node that sits on the outside of the heart, and then you have the um, AV node um, that, um, sorry, the um, transitional cells that um, conduct whatever is going on in the sinus node to the rest of the atrium, and that's where you have your regular conduction. And actually what you see on the EKG is conduction to the atrium. It's not really sinus node conduction, but since we see it in the um, atrium, then we can assume that the sinus node, of course, is firing. Well, if you have any blockage of that, then that becomes a problem. We typically can't see first degree, right? Because first degree is a equal, um, you know, delay, in which case, you know, you really wouldn't know because we don't have a lead that sits in the, um, on the sinus node. Third degree, um, you know, sinoatrial block, again, that's something that you would not see. It would just look like a sinus pause. You just wouldn't see any P waves, you know, so the sinus node might be firing, but we wouldn't see it because it wouldn't go through the, um, to the, um, to the atrial node. And so those are patients who sometimes they will come in with either an ectopic atrial rhythm that you can notice on EKG, or they'll come in with just pauses um, and a junctional escape rhythm. Um, but you can see the second degree type one and type two. It becomes a little bit um, difficult because instead of you seeing um, changes in your PR interval, you have to imagine in your mind that your sinus node is firing, but something is going on here that's not producing atrial um, depolarization. And so you don't have a P wave. And so what typically happens is you'll see um, your PP interval slowly decreasing, and then all of a sudden you see a pause. That would be a second degree winky block of a sinoatrial block for um, the sinoatrial block second degree um, type two. In this particular situation, you're going to have a PR interval that's um, correct, a PP interval that's consistent, but you will have um, a pause with this pause being a multiple of your original PP interval. And so that's something that you can definitely look at. Um, for atrioventricular conduction, this is your normal atrial, um, atrioventricular conduction where your PR interval is typically less than 200 milliseconds. Um, we use the EP, um, EP study for us to actually look at what's going on in the um, Hisperkinji system and what we expect to see 
is that your Hisbrokinji system should have a really short conduction. Your AH interval or your conduction through your AB node could be a little bit longer, um, but your AH interval plus your HB interval will give you a PR interval on your surface EKG. So sometimes what we see in the surface EKG can actually tell us what's going on um, you know, in the EP study without actually having to do that. So for atrioventricular block, that's second degree, it could be pathologic, but then sometimes it could be normal, right? If you have a patient who has sleep apnea, um, if they have atrial tachycardia, the problem is actually the tachycardia is not actually their conduction system. Sometimes you have inferior wall myocardial infarctions that actually affect the um, blood supply to the AV node. And of course, some drugs can cause it as well. In which case, you know, by changing the condition, sometimes by exercising, by giving atropine, you can actually deci um, decide which one um, is important and what you need to intervene on. So as a rule of thumb, your atrioventricular block, your second degree AV block type one typically happens in the AV node versus your second degree type two that usually happens below the level of the AV node and typically is something that you want to intervene on sooner rather than later. So if you are looking at an EKG and you see group beating, you should be thinking to yourself that this is as a result of you know, atrioventricular block or second degree AV block, depending on you know, what it could be. So now going back to some questions, you know, this is an EKG. Um, if you look here, you can kind of see your PR intervals, and then all of a sudden you see pauses. You definitely see that group beating. But can somebody tell me um, what you consider the diagnosis here to be? And if you can put that in the chat. Okay. Somebody said inferior MI. That's correct. But then what else is happening? If you were looking at the conduction um, for this patient, particularly with these pauses. Yes. So somebody said winky box, second degree Mobitz one. Exactly. The easiest way to look at this is when you see, first of all, when you look at the EKG, remember what I said, when you look at the EKG and you see your RR interval, is kind of irregular, right? And it's regularly irregular, right? So you see what we call group beating. So these four are going together, these four are going together. Then in your mind, you should be thinking, okay, this is a second degree AV block. Now, what kind of second degree is it, right? So the relationship between the P wave and the QRS is going to give you an answer. So you have a blocked P wave here, you have a blocked P wave there. If you look at the P wave immediately following the blocked P wave, and you look at the P wave that immediately precedes the blocked P wave, when you look at those, if there's um, the PR interval there is different, particularly if this one, the one following is shorter than the one preceding, then that means that that's a second degree type one. If it's a Mobitz two, this PR interval and that PR interval would be exactly the same. So this is a Mobitz one or Winky Bach, right? So in this case, does this patient need a pacemaker? Yes or no? So somebody said no, 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 no. So what if um, I said that this patient, actually, they took them to the cath lab and they noticed that the patient had a very small, and this is like going out of the box a little bit, but basically they said, okay, this patient had a very um, small um, RCA and had a more dominant, um, you know, wrap around LED than what? Would you consider that this patient needed a pacemaker or not? So I think everybody is still saying no. Everybody said no, yep. Thought about it, no. All right, moving on. What is your diagnosis for this one? Yeah, 
that can be KG, rhythm strip. What would you say this diagnosis is? Two to one AV block, exactly. So as you can see, unlike that first um, EKG that I showed you where you had regular QRSs as well, in this particular one, you can see that your PR interval is the same when you consider from here to there to there. And then also there's one intervening one that isn't. So this is two to one AV block. Now, can you tell if somebody has two to one AV block, can you tell if it's a Mobitz one or a Mobitz two? Because a two to one AV block technically is a second degree AV block, right? So would you be able to tell if it's Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2? Somebody said Mobitz 2, Mobitz 2, RCA 2. Mobitz 2. So, and somebody was very emphatic in saying, Seifu was very emphatic in saying, you cannot tell. And exactly, you can't really tell because for you to define whether something is Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, you have to be able to see the progression. So you need to see whether it extends or whether it stays the same. And that's impossible to determine if it's a 2 to 1 AV block. So the only thing that you can tell is that it's 2 to 1. Now, there are a few things that you can look at to kind of see um, whether it's Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, or whether the block is suprahissian or infrahissian, one of which is, you know, looking at um, what's happening in your QRS. Um, and this particular patient said, does this patient need a pacemaker? You know, somebody said yes. And it really all depends, right? If you have a QRS width that is normal, and it's, you know, your PR of your conducted wave is greater than 30 um, milliseconds, then you can be rest assured that most likely your block is in the AV node, in which case you might actually not need to put in a pacemaker. However, if it is lower than that, then you kind of consider that, hey, maybe this block is actually below the level of the AV node. And so in which case this has a high um, propensity to progress into a complete heart block. So those patients typically will need some. And unfortunately, sometimes they can go from two to one AV block to actually like a four to one or a sudden loss of, you know, the escape rhythm, in which case this becomes a really big issue. Now you want to see also what is their response to exercise as well as what is their response to a carotid massage, right? So if you have, you give them atropine or you exercise them and they actually improve conduction, and that means that the block is in the AV node, doesn't really need a pacemaker. If it's below that, or if it worsens conduction, that means that the block is in the Hisperkinji system. And actually, um, that means that you do need a pacemaker. On the opposite end, if you do a carotid massage, and first of all, before anybody does a carotid massage, please make sure that the patient doesn't have any bruises. We don't want to give anybody a stroke because you really do have to massage that and kind of be uncomfortable with it for you to actually see the effect. And if the patient, you massage um, the carotids and it actually improves conduction, that actually shows that the patient um, will have block in the Hisperkinji system. These are the patients who sometimes we suspect it and will actually tell you, hey, just give the patient a beta blocker. Trust me, it's going to work. And most people don't do it because they don't believe us because, you know, we're crazy. But if you slow down conduction through the AV node, that gives the Hisperkinji system a chance to um, recover, and that actually will improve conduction. So that will actually tell you that, hey, we actually need to put in a pacemaker because this patient has block in the Hisperkinji system. Retrograde conduction, um, that's something that's a little bit more technical. Um, so when we're kind of figuring out, okay, for sinus node dysfunction, whether the patient needs a pacemaker or not, Class one is if they have symptomatic bradycardia, sinus pauses, basically if they have symptoms, they definitely need a pacemaker. If you're class 2A, if they have sinus node dysfunction with a heart rate less than 40, with a history of symptoms or syncope of unknown origin, 
um, then um, you should, you know, you should put in a pacemaker. That's a two way to be if they have minimal symptoms, but have a resting heart rate less than 40 beats per minute. That is a two B indication for placement of a pacemaker. Class three, asymptomatic patients. So if the patient, no matter what they have, you know, they're asymptomatic um, for sinus node dysfunction, then you don't have to put in a pacemaker for those patients. For AV node, um, class one, third degree or second degree with symptoms, of course, um, documented pauses that are greater than three seconds. Even if you have like, so if you have asymptomatic third degree or advanced second degree AV block and pauses that are greater than five seconds or asymptomatic third degree advanced um, second degree with document pauses greater than three seconds. All of these, um, you know, are an exception to the um, symptomatic rule. So they can be asymptomatic. Now, of course, if you've ablated the AV junction, definitely do that. Um, if you have like post-op AV block, that's not going to resolve. You definitely don't want the patient to die of, you know, AV block um, after having surgery. Um, and then, of course, if they have second or third degree AV block during exercise with no um, risk of, um, of ischemia. Um, and then these are the ones if they have neuromuscular diseases, second degree AV block with symptoms, asymptomatic third degree block with a heart rate that's greater than 40, but LV dysfunction or cardiomyopathy. Um, those patients are all class one for placement of a pacemaker. For 2A, if you have persistent um, AV block, so third degree basically put in a pacemaker if you see one. Um, if you have infrahissian block on an EP study, so if that HV interval is long, then you definitely want to put a pacemaker there. Um, and then um, if they have a type two second degree, but basically a narrow QRS, um, then, you know, that's a class 2A, but if it's white, then it becomes a class 1 indication. Um, 2B, um, drug use or toxicity. If you expect the, um, you know, effect to continue even after the drug is withdrawn, definitely put in a pacemaker there. Um, and then your class 3 is, you know, definitely first degree AV block, particularly if it's asymptomatic. There's sometimes that you have symptomatic third degree AV block. So basically the person has such a long PR interval that when um, the atrium is contracting, it's contracting against a closed um, AV, um, AV valve, like a mitral valve or, um, um, or a tricuspid valve. And that can cause symptoms for the patient, similar to a pacemaker syndrome. If you see that, then maybe, you know, it's necessary for you to put in a pacemaker. But if the patient is asymptomatic, then you don't have to. And of course, if you're asymptomatic with your second degree type one, if you think it's going to be super hissian, um, or if you have cases that are expected to resolve, such as increased vagal tone, patients who have sleep apnea, um, that you see that there. Of course, if you've diagnosed the patient with Lyme disease, or if they have any type of drug toxicity, then you don't want to put a pacemaker there. The most um, interesting situation is when patients will have symptomatic bradycardia that's out of proportion to what you would expect, but the drug that they're on is a beta blocker. Well, if they're on a beta blocker because of some other reason that you can take the beta blocker off, then they don't need to have a pacemaker placed. However, if they have heart failure and the difference between, you know, putting a, um, you know, a pacemaker and putting in an ICD and the patient having heart failure, continued heart failure as a result, is you know, the use of the beta blocker, then you definitely will want to place the beta blocker. Same thing goes in for um, atrial um, fibrillation. If you take off the beta blocker and the patient goes into AFib with RVR, but you need the beta blocker, but when you give the patient the beta blocker, they actually get really symptomatic, then that would be somebody that you would want to put um, in a pacemaker as a result. So in conclusion, you know, for the patient selection piece, first degree AV block, if they have symptoms, then sure. If there's no symptoms, then no. Second degree, most of the time, yes, particularly if they have symptoms. And third degree, definitely yes for a pacemaker if they have symptoms. Okay. Now, um, somebody had asked a little bit earlier, um, or going back to some of the questions that I asked initially, what other information would you need from a patient who um, has um, clear indications for a pacemaker? Why would we ask to get an echo? Well, one of the things that you want to consider is if the patient has heart failure, because if the patient does have heart failure, 
then you want to see why they have heart failure. And then you might actually be indicated to place an ICD. You don't want to put in a pacemaker when the patient needs an ICD. And worst case scenario, um, if the patient can't afford an ICD, then you might actually need to place a biventricular pacemaker um, just so that you can help with the um, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Um, and because those patients, if they have heart failure, they'll actually get much worse if they have a high degree of pacing. So that's one of the things that you should consider. Now, a solution to placement of, you know, a biventricular pacer, since that is an extra lead and is more expensive. So a solution in resource poor, um, poor environments might actually be the left bundle lead. And then this is the EKG, and you can kind of see how narrow it really looks. This is not a typical paced QRS. Um, and you might tell yourself, well, this doesn't look to be paced at all, but you can kind of see the transition from her native to the paced QRS. Most likely the programming was going to be like she wasn't going to pace anyway, but at the very least, if she was going to pace, you would see um, that she would have um, a normal um, QRS. And um, that is all I have. So if you have any questions, um, you can go to see us on our website. The QR code is for our website. Um, I would like to thank um, all these folks who have, you know, helped with the, um, you know, spread and um, accessibility of um, pacemakers um, all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, if you have any questions, please um, raise your hand. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I really, uh, I appreciate uh, that presentation. We all appreciate that presentation, Dr. Kuro. Um, looks like Dr. Dafe is uh, raising his hand to speak as well. So Dr. Dafe, so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Joma, thank you so much. Very well educated and uh, uh, excellent presentation, man. I really enjoyed it. In Budo, my network at a point in time was uh, off and on. So, but very great presentation. I wanted to ask, man, uh, can you throw more light on um, mobile cat labs? Because I found out that we don't have uh, that, that significant number in the South Sarah Africa compared to what is obtainable in India. Oh, you mean like mobile cat labs that you can put on a bus? Yes. You know, I mean, when you were comparing, you know, you yes. compare the CM and the cat lab. Yes. So I was also thinking, okay, what of a mobile cat lab and a CM is, um, so the mobile is there cat any lab issue is, can look at it? Yeah, the mobile cat lab is actually a cat lab. So mm. um, it basically, um, yeah, so the mobile cat lab is basically similar to a cat lab. So the cost of it can be high. It's definitely much higher than a CR. Um, yeah. And then you have the same, um, you know, limitations with regards to lead shielding, et cetera. But the good thing about a mobile cat lab is that you can go from place to place, right? So you're not limited by um, location. So that's one thing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. You know, um, actually, like here, we've used mobile cath labs before. Um, basically, I think we had used it in a couple of hospitals where something happened with the actual room in the cath lab, and then they got a mobile cath lab, and we would basically take patients in and bring patients out. Um, so it's pretty much when you walk into the mobile cath lab, it actually looks like a regular cath lab. Um, it's a little bit smaller on the smaller side, but um, it has a, you know, um, an II and the high power and, you know, all of that. And you're able to do coronary angiograms and um, able to put in all sorts of pacers. So yeah, um, it's definitely an option if we have a sponsor to buy a yeah. one. <laughs> then you can thank definitely, you, you know, you can definitely take it from place to place for sure. Yeah, thank you, man. Any other questions? So in this particular patient, you know, um, the one that we talked about, particularly her being a young lady, you know, um, or a young person, um, you have some considerations that you have to think about when you are figuring out what kind of device that you want to place. First thing is, you know, if you can have a device placed that does not give this patient heart failure, that would be the best thing. 
Um, and the left bundle is kind of coming out with that. We call it conduction system pacing. Um, you know, if you have um, left bundle pacing for right now, there's no limitation or there's no recommendation that, oh, it's only patients who have heart failure. So CRT, you can only do it or the, it's only indicated in patients who have a demonstrated ejection fraction that's less than 50%. For left bundle pacing, you can do it in everyone. And so sometimes folks will say, you know what, I'd rather do left bundle pacing than do, um, you know, regular, um, a regular pacer in a patient, even if they don't have a high degree of pacing, because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And then if they do have a high degree of pacing, even though their ejection fraction is normal, um, maybe it could get, they could be one of those 20% of people who will actually end up having a decreased um, ejection fraction as a result of a high degree of pacing. And so placement of a left bundle pacer or conduction system pacing could actually be protective in those kinds of patients. Um, and so that's the reason why sometimes um, we end up um, doing that um, in um, certain patients. So um, somebody um, wanted to um, speak, uh, Dr. Gandia. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Ijoma. That mm -hmm. was a very nice presentation. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I just I just wanted to to compliment on the uh, conductive uh, system person. Mm -hmm. Actually, I quite agree with you that the current practice uh, in the other centers they have just decided almost all patients who are coming with the indication for pacemaker, mm -hmm. excluding the CRT, they will mm -hmm. just go to conductive system person that is left band or blanch. Uh, earlier, face mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe um, another point to add is that you don't need all the uh, proper instrument because you need the, I mean, the left band of blanche earlier specific read and also the the the, the catheter that can you, the the select site catheter that can mm -hmm. I mean enable you to go to the center, mm -hmm. but. Um, it is quite possible if you have the select site catheter, uh, just to use the ordinary lead, you can uh, that can aid you to go to the septum and use the, the normal pacemaker lead that we are using, and you can get almost the same results. And I think because you've really seen a lot of patients once you you put a mini um apical pacing, there is a high chance that they are getting to get complication, including atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I agree with you for sure. I think that, um, you know, you definitely need um, for the select secure because that's a very specific lead. Um, you know, we should be careful about the lead that you put in the left bundle area because what, what is ending up happening, right, is that you are screwing in the lead into the septum. So you're going to have a hinge point at the lead um, that could result in fracture right, in the future. And so that's the reason why the actual lead, the 3830 that Medtronic um, produced, um, it's been tested to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I believe the new ones that are indicated for that now, like the Tendril, the 2088 for Abbott, and um, I know there's a Biotronic lead that's specific for that. Um, you know, I, I think that that's the reason why you would want to use those specifically indicated leads for left bundle pacing and not just any lead because not all the leads have been tested and have been gone through that integrity where you're sure that that hinge point will not result in a fracture. And remember, you're also screwing it into the septum. So extracting it is going to be a whole nother ball of wax. So you definitely want to um, make sure that you're being careful and definitely using only the indicated um, tools. And, you know, some of them, like I wouldn't use a 5096 for, um, or is it a 5046? A 5076, right. I wouldn't use a 5076 or 4076, which is a Medtronic pacing lead. I wouldn't use that for the left bundle area just because they themselves have not cleared it for left bundle pacing. So even though technically you could, um, I wouldn't. And somebody asked the question about, um, you know, whether um, I can explain more why some two to one AV block doesn't need a pacemaker. Um, remember, a two to one AV block is a second degree AV block. So if you have a second degree AV block that has two to one, 
but the two to one is in certain conditions. So for instance, if the patient was on a beta blocker or was on clonidine or was, um, you know, and it basically shows that this is in the AV node. So you did maneuvers that proved that it was in the AV node. So you did a carotid um, massage and um, conduction decrease or you gave atropine or exercise and conduction improved, then that meant that, okay, it's in the AV node, most likely it's going to recover. So those patients might not need a pacemaker. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't observe the patient. Um, you know, for sure, that is definitely something that you should do. Um, and then, but you should consider that, that those patients, especially if they're asymptomatic, those patients um, might not need a pacer. So really at the top of the, indications for patients who need a pacemaker, it's symptoms. So any patient who comes to you says, hey, I fainted, I was dizzy. Oh, you know, I broke up my leg because, you know, I don't know, I fainted and I didn't know why. And then you figure out that they have some sort of atrioventricular block, definitely needs a pacemaker. For those patients who are asymptomatic, that's when you start teasing things through. So if you have asymptomatic patients and they have, um, you know, third degree AV block, they still indicate it for a pacer. If they have second degree type two, so that means that their QRS is wide or their PR interval is short, and you basically think that, hey, this block is infrahissian, which basically means that it's below the level of the AV node, most likely they'll need a pacemaker. However, if it's nodal, then it's most likely recoverable, and so you might not need a pacer. And that's pretty much the way that we typically do things. And then for the sinus node, Typically, if it's above, um, the sinus um, rate is above 40 beats a minute, most likely, and they're asymptomatic, most likely they won't need a pacer. If it's below that, or if they're symptomatic and they don't have what we call chronotropic competence, which basically means that they're not able to raise their heart rate with um, you know, activity, then um, you um, are probably going to need a pacemaker. And, um, Rafaela Atasi, Dr. Atasi, you raised up your hand. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, you hear me, guys? Yes, we do. Okay. I, uh, uh, I just want to add a note to the last uh, uh, questionnaire, uh, the, the person that talking about pacing in the septum. And uh, I urge uh, the new implanters to try to avoid the right ventricular apex if they can. It does not have to be uh, uh, left bundle pacing. It does not have to be, uh, you know, uh, his bundle pacing, but please avoid pacing uh, in the RV apex. Uh, studies have been there for years now that uh, uh, talks about that place, uh, the apex could be, uh, you know, associated with uh, uh, cardiomyopathies, with uh, more atrial fibrillation, more perforation, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So early in your career, when you start learning how to implant, uh, uh, if you start at this point, avoiding the apex and keep avoiding the apex, the, the, the perfect position is, like uh, you said, it's the left bundle, the conduction system. But mm -hmm. even if you're, uh, just avoid the, the apex, it, it still works. Pacing the septum still probably much better than pacing the apex. That's the only observation I have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Gandhi? Yes, I quite agree with him. That's the concept that I was trying to, 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 to explain before that mm -hmm. you, you are trying to use even the regular lead to go to the septum because I know you might not get the, uh, I mean, the uh, exactly the results that you would have obtained if you are having a special lead, but mm -hmm. it, it, is give, it, it is giving some, I mean, passing closer to the conductive system, you are at least can get an allocure less complex, but still the other people, they, are, they think that even if you go to septum and you don't get a, exactly the allocure less complex, uh, probably you are having almost the same pacing the muscles because the problem with the apical pacing is that you are creating a left band of branch block. And mm -hmm. with that, that means you are causing the synchrony and therefore increasing the left, left ventricular, at, I mean, left arterial pressures that are actually lead to electrical remodeling within the atrium. And this actually predisposes to heart failure, AF, and also leading to 
all co complication in the patient. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there are many schools, but I, 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 if you ask me, I think I, if I, because we are talking especially in the, those that areas that are resource limited, then mm -hmm. I will try to use what I have the normal is to go to the septum and assure, see what the patient, I mean, expecting the patient's going to, to, to feel better as uh, compared to if I had put the lead in the RV apex. That's yeah, the idea behind. I mean, I think, I guess, you know, because when we say there's always a struggle, right, when you are in a resource limited environment to do what is best, but you also don't want to do harm. And so, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, using what is available, I guess my um, point was, you know, you have to be sure that the lead that you're using is going to be able to do the job that you want it to do. Because in the short term, you might be able to help, but you don't want a situation where you cause harm in the long term, particularly if the patient is younger, right? So in the short, and then also we love left bundle, now, um, but there's still a lot to be learned from Love Bundle, and we still have a lot to um, discover. There still has to be a lot of follow up. You know, I kind of want to urge us to take caution. For instance, you know, a long time ago, we um, were going, everybody was going to the HIS, and now almost nobody goes to the HIS anymore, <laughs> um, just mainly because of other considerations. Not that his the his placement was not a good idea, but um, eventually it was something that didn't actually stand the test of time. And who knows, the same thing might happen with Left Bundle and we might be doing something else, you know, a few years later. So the only thing that we can do for right now is, you know, um, make sure that we're using the tools the way that they're supposed to they're supposed to be used um, and reaching out to, you know, foundations, you know, like powers, there's the um, Melvin Shaman Foundation, there's My Heart, Your Heart, um, there's um, Dr. Joel Dunning. Um, if the specific leads that you need that are not available, then maybe we can make sure that they're available so that at least you're using the indicated tools for the, um, for the um, indications that you need them to, and you're not having to make do um, and in the future, that causes harm. So, well, thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have something else to say? No, I just just want to make a point. I agree with the last uh, uh, speaker very much. So, uh, it's not uh, uh, using the available technology in the uh, left bundle to paste the conduction system. It's just my point is avoid the apex. That's what I'm trying to to say. Yes. Uh, use yes. Use use I, whatever technology you have, the leads you have, but avoid the apex. You know, mm -hmm. it it doesn't cost any. Doesn't cost the same leads, the same techniques, same everything. Just stay away from the apex. Thank you very much. Appreciate the chance. Thank you. But, but the Thank last you. comment, uh, Dr. Joma, uh, what's the cost difference between the regular lead and this uh, new? I find it's like the same, the same price. So maybe we just it's just the matter of ordering the proper equipment because I uh -huh. does I don't think if they are they make a, a a huge difference in terms of purchase. Yeah, and that's that's probably it. Is just kind of making sure that you're ordering the same thing, for sure. Or I mean, you're ordering there the is right the introducer. Thing? There is the introducer. I don't know how much it costs. Uh, uh, and the lead itself probably is a little bit more expensive than the, the traditional pacing leads here in the States. But I mean, in Africa and in other world, parts of the world, you know, $100 here, $100 there adds up, adds up significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say the, the left bundle sheet is much harder to come by on the right. continent itself. You know, as as more people show interest and as with more implanters, I think you will see it proliferate. But I'm trying to, to think. I'm trying to think in this direction. Okay, you, maybe the price, maybe let's say it's, it's very not very huge, significant. But you you avoid purchasing the right tool, then you get into heart failure because of the. I mean, you're having regular lead, and you need the CRT that is too much expensive as compared. I think maybe sometimes we need to 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 think 
ahead of time what's going to happen because you are avoiding this, but you are creating a more problem, then you get more cost to, to incur. I, mean, I like honestly, your way of thinking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, honestly, like these are discussions that definitely need to be had on a you know wider level because unfortunately, what is um happening here is that we have small hospitals, like you're making decisions based off of like a small um, small population, right? Versus if, you know, a lot of this was being supported, um, if there were insurance plans and things like that, then you could make population-based um, decisions um, that would help, um, you know, your local purchasing power. So I think that the, the problem here is that maybe sometimes because you're buying for your hospital and you don't have the strength of collective bargaining, then, you know, things end up being more expensive when they don't necessarily have to be. But those are definitely discussions that have to be had at a huge forum um, with the um, stakeholders and on the one hand and the, um, the folks in industry on the other so that they make these technologies available at a fair cost, um, at a fair market cost, you know, considering um, the price per person or the healthcare um, dollars that are available in each different country. So, um, but thank you so much, everyone, for such a great discussion. Um, AJ, I didn't know if you had anything else to add. No, uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Noah, for going to that. I think you did a really good job of laying out what's needed from a holistic perspective. It's not just, you know, the resources, but it's the human resources as well. It's the knowledge, it's the support staff, um, and it all kind of comes together. So. Um, you know, we really kind of got into the weeds here talking about left level, more complex stuff than we started off on pacemakers, but I think that shows the level of sophistication in many of these programs around the continent. So if you are new to this and you're trying to start a pacemaker program, we highly recommend to leverage these relationships, reach out to us, reach out to our foundations, reach out to the individual organizations on this call. And, you know, people, people are here to help and support and talk you through the process. And we don't have to make the same mistakes, you know, again, we can all kind of learn from each other's experience. That's what we're all here for as a community. So really, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone being on the call today. All right. Thank you.